before we begin our discussions and practice of Vipassana, I'd like to begin with a short review based on the three vehicles chart. So what we saw earlier was that the foundation of all Buddhist traditions is the Four Noble Truths, and this is the core of what's now termed the uh, Theravada vehicle, transmitted through the Pali language from India. Theravada vehicle or Theravada Buddhist traditions, of course, include uh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and so on. And in these traditions, uh, the goal of the spiritual path, the third noble truth, the truth of cessation, is to be liberated from suffering to achieve this goal of nirvana. Remember we said that someone who's achieved nirvana is called an arhat. And then to strive for that goal, of course, we have to cultivate this aspiration of renunciation, this aspiration to be liberated from suffering. And we can cultivate this through particularly reflecting on the first two noble truths, the truth of suffering, to understand the condition we find ourselves in, the truth of the cause of suffering, to understand that that's due to the mental afflictions, and understanding that we can eliminate those mental afflictions, and thereby we can develop this aspiration to be free. And then, of course, the fourth noble truth, truth of the path. What is the medicine we need to practice? Uh, here we saw the Noble Eightfold Path, these eight practices um, that uh, is the core of the path as it's presented in the Theravada Buddhist traditions. And there we saw that these eight practices can be condensed into these uh, three core areas of practice of ethics, concentration and wisdom. And here the wisdom practice, or another name for that is Vipassana practice, we saw here that in the Theravada vehicle, um, we're mainly talking about these three marks of existence, impermanence, suffering, and no self. That by realizing impermanence, that will really um, dramatically reduce our attachment, aversion, and so forth. Mm. But that also will help us in terms of realizing suffering or dukkha, the first noble truth, the condition we find ourselves in. And then that, through that reflection and the, <coughs> reflecting on the cause of suffering, we can develop this aspiration to be free of suffering, that renunciation, and then to strive to, to find the goal of nirvana, we need to eliminate our, our distorted view of reality. And here in Theravada Vehicle, of course, uh, the fundamental distorted view of reality is this grasping to self. So we need to realize this no self, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later in this session. If we can realize we do not exist in this overinflated false way, we can eliminate all mental afflictions and suffering and achieve the goal of nirvana. And then we saw in the Mahayana vehicle, which is based on the perfection of wisdom teachings of the Buddha, there is identified a further goal uh, we can achieve, and that's the goal of enlightenment, full enlightenment. Of course, if we achieve that goal, we become Buddha. And again, to strive for that goal of enlightenment, uh, we cultivate this aspiration called bodhicitta. And if we um, achieve that, if we um, cultivate that aspiration of bodhicitta, we become known as a bodhisattva. So then the bodhisattva practices the six perfections. So that's the um, the main or the the, the, the main pre the normal presentation for the path. What are the main practices to uh, we need to engage in to achieve enlightenment? And those six perfections, as we saw with the Eightfold Path, can be condensed into those same three core areas of practice of ethics, concentration, and wisdom. And here, when we talk about wisdom practice or Vipassana practice, we're mainly talking about this wisdom of emptiness in Sanskrit, shunyata. And that's the main topic for tomorrow. And so, of course, this wisdom of emptiness is the realization that everything's empty of independent existence. Nothing exists independently. 
So this this grasping on to independent me, independent world in the Mahayana is identified as the fundamental distorted view, the fundamental ignorance that we need to eliminate. And we, through realizing this wisdom of emptiness, we can achieve this uh, goal of enlightenment. But then there's also a Vajrayana vehicle, which I think we haven't really talked about much so far. So maybe a few comments about that. So here we have the Vajrayana vehicle, another name for that is Tantra. And what we see here is that the goal of Vajrayana or Tantra is, is enlightenment. We need to develop the aspiration of Bodhicitta. And in terms of the wisdom, the Vipassana, it's also emptiness. So then the question is, what's the difference then between Mahayana and Vajrayana? The difference is the level of mind that we are using in the path, the level of mind we are using to realize emptiness. So remember earlier we talked about three levels of mind, coarse, subtle, very subtle. Coarse or surface level of mind is the mind that's active now. And what we are doing with this mind we have now, we are refining that, making it more stable, more clear, more focused through the shamatha practice. And if we actually achieve shamatha, then that mind becomes subtle level of mind. And we use that because it's much more clear, focused in the Vipassana practice to achieve enlightenment. But then we identified there's a, a third level of mind, a very subtle level of mind, that's even more powerful. And that's what we're trying to use here in Tantra or Vajrayana practice. We're trying to gain access to that very subtle mind. Because if we can gain access to that and use that to realize emptiness, we can accelerate the spiritual path to enlightenment. How we gain access to that very subtle mind is these two practices here called the two stages. Generation stage and completion stage. So generation stage practice here um, generally involves um, practicing a practice manual called a sadhana, where we do lots of visualizations, chanting mantra and so forth. But at a more deeper level, that generation stage practice is is really more about developing a high level of focus, so shamatha. Because what we are doing in completion stage practice is we are attempting to cause that very subtle mind to become manifest. And in, in completion stage practice, generally we do that by manipulating subtle energies in the body. You know, in Tantra or Vajrayana, the subtle body is usually explained as channels. So we've talked about there's a central channel running down the middle of the body, two side channels, and lots of channels running out from those. Of course, these channels are not anything you can see with your eye or any you can't see that with any instruments of modern technology. They're very subtle energy channels. And then, of course, what's running in those channels is subtle energy, and then also along the central channel, we have these constrictions called chakras. And <clears throat> to cause the very subtle mind to become manifest, what we are doing in completion stage practice is we are attempting to withdraw all the subtle energies into the central channel and causing them to come to the heart chakra. And that will cause the heart chakra to open and thereby the very subtle mind will become active or manifest. So that's what we are doing in completion stage practice. Now, Tantra or Vajrayana is often called resultant vehicle, whereas both Theravada and Mahayana are what's called causal vehicle. Because both in Theravada and Mahayana, our perspective is, here we are now, there's the goal of Nirvana, there's the goal of enlightenment, these are the practices we need to do now to achieve that goal there. We're looking forward on the spiritual path. Whereas in Tantra Vajrayana, we use the complete opposite perspective. And that is that we do 
all practices from the perspective of the enlightened state. So remember, that was a little bit the idea we talked about, idea of Buddha nature being a potential for enlightenment versus Buddha nature meaning there's a Buddha within already. That's the perspective we take in Tantra of Vajrayana. Which means to practice generation stage, of course, because these are sort of levels of practice. So to practice Vajrayana, we have to have a good level in the Mahayana and the good level in the foundation practices. Which means to practice Tantra, <coughs> we need renunciation, we need bodhicitta, and we need the wisdom of emptiness at least at some sort of a little bit experiential level. Because in this generation stage practice, when we're doing this practice manual called sadhana, we are arising as the deity, meaning we're arising in a fully enlightened form and doing the practice from that perspective. But to do that properly, we need an understanding and ideally experience of emptiness because otherwise if we don't have that then all we are doing is we are pretending to be a deity pretending to be enlightened and then we're grasping onto that as me so we're just replacing one delusion with another delusion that this is me versus now in, in Buddha that's me grasping to that so we are to dissolve everything into emptiness and then from emptiness arise as the deity if this practice is going to be effective. So therefore, if we really want to practice Tantra Vajrayana, we need to put effort in cultivating this renunciation, the bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness. Then Tantra or Vajrayana can be very, very effective. Sure. Um, the door of entry into the Theravada vehicle, of course, is renunciation. The door of entry into the Mahayana is the Bodhicitta. And the door of entry into Tantra Vajrayana is empowerment. When we get introduced to these practices, these sadhana practices. But to be able to practice sadhana well, we need those three things at some sort of experiential level. Otherwise, I think it's not going to be very effective and we can probably have better use of our time in other practices. So what I'd like to do in terms of the Pashina practice then is this evening now briefly look at the Theravada level. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow, I spend most of the day on the emptiness practice. But before I do that, is there any questions about the three vehicles? Something the Tantra is in yoga. Uh, so, Tantra yoga. here, when I say Tantra, I mean Buddhist Tantra. There's also Hindu Tantra. Mm -hmm. So, it's not the same. I mean, there's probably some similarities, but. We shouldn't assume they're the same. In fact, they're not. Subtle energy and chakra. And, and there are a number of systems that talk about subtle energies and chakras, mm -hmm. but they're not the same. For example, in Buddhism, a chakra is a constriction around the central channel. Now, I don't think that's how a chakra is seen in some other traditions. There is constriction. Constriction. It's it's, it's it's constricting the central channel. And I think there are other traditions that don't talk about chakras in that way. So we need to be careful not to think that they, if they use the word chakra, they talk about the same thing. There's maybe some similarities, but maybe differences. Uh, is uh, Vajrayana practice a lot? Is it common? Right. Um, in Vajrayana Tantra, is very widely practiced in all the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Outside of Tibetan Buddhism, in Buddhism, it's not practiced very widely because in most other countries, Buddhism spread to those countries before 
Tantra of Vajrayana was widely practiced in India. So Tantra didn't sort of get transmitted very much to those countries. Whereas it was exactly at the time where Tantra Vajrayana was becoming more very widely practiced in India from about the 7th, 8th century onwards. That's exactly the time that Buddhism went to Tibet. So we have a lot of Tantra Vajrayana going to Tibet. And our days? And? Uh, today? Yeah. There's, um, is there a place we can go and study this or only specific people get a certain teacher? Yeah. I mean, historically, um, you would only really get introduced to Tantra from your personal teacher and only when, the, if they were qualified, of course, and they saw that you had the necessary foundation, you were ready. Otherwise, they wouldn't say anything to you. Nowadays, there's lots of books about Tantra people reading and trying, dabbling themselves. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. I mean, this Tantra Vajrayana is very powerful, but, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, particularly when it comes to Tantra. Particularly people liking to play around with subtle energies. Not a good idea. I mean, you play with subtle energies, you're playing with the mind. And if you don't do that in a controlled, structured way, you can really screw up your mind. Many cases of that happening. I know a couple of pers people personally who've screwed up their mind by dabbling in that. Not a good idea. Okay, let's look now at uh, Vipassana. So, in the Shamatha practice, we are cultivating mindfulness, we're strengthening mindfulness so that we can then apply that mindfulness in Vipassana practice, we can apply that mindfulness by to investigate nature of reality. So here at the foundation level, um, that's often called what's called the four applications of mindfulness. So we are applying mindfulness to investigate different things. And in the classic presentation here, we first investigate the body. <clears throat> and then we investigate our feelings. Of course, that's not doesn't mean emotions. It means our pleasant, unpleasant and neutral experiences. <clears throat> And then we investigate the mind. And then lastly, we investigate phenomena in general. And what we are doing here at the foundation level, at Four Noble Truths level, in Theravada, when we investigate those four things, we are coming to three insights called the three marks of existence. So for example, first we examine our body to come to see that everything in the body is changing moment by moment. And then we look at our feelings and see they're also changing moment by moment. We look in the mind and see everything in the mind is changing moment by moment. And then all phenomena we experience, everything we experience is changing moment by moment. So by going through these, we come to realize every single thing we experience is changing moment by moment. Of course, this is not just intellectual. Intellectually, we know that already. This is experiential in meditation. 
That's why shamatha is the basis of vipassana, because if our mind is not calm, clear and focused, when we do this investigation, we won't come to any insight because our mind is sort of distracted and not focused well. And then, of course, we can investigate those four again to come to realise <coughs> suffering. Remember, suffering here is dukkha. So investigating our body, the feelings, mind and phenomena in general to come to realise that we are stuck in this state of dukkha, that this is the human condition. Because by coming to realise this and then particularly realising that we are stuck in this state through mental afflictions, particularly distorted view of reality, we can go on to develop that aspiration of renunciation. And then, again, we investigate these four uh, things and we come to realise no self. There is no self to be found in the body, the feelings, mind or any phenomena in, at all. <coughs> and if we can realise this... <coughs> <coughs> And if we can come to realise this no self, then that is the uh, distorted view of reality that is the basis of all mental afflictions and suffering. We realise this, we can move and to the goal of nirvana. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little bit of Vipassana practice. And so we'll start at the beginning. And the beginning is we investigate the body to come to an insight into impermanence. And one way to do this that's in a number of the Theravada traditions is to simply scan the body. Observing the reality of the body. Is there anything in the body that is stable and unchanging? Or is everything we experience changing moment by moment? So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to do a body scan, observing the body and sensations in the body, and seeing is there anything there stable and unchanging, or is everything simply changing moment by moment? Any questions? Okay, let's do that practice. Oh, I think my line's okay. We, we don't need to have the eyes open for this practice. Setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness and vigilance.
relaxing more deeply with each out breath. And with each out breath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them. and allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. And simply becoming aware of the rhythm of the breath. And so we can begin our Vipassana practice by applying mindfulness to the body, investigating the reality of the body, and seeing if there's anything there stable and unchanging, or is everything changing moment by moment. And we can do this by scanning through the body. So bring your attention to the crown of your head and simply notice any sensations in this area. And then slowly moving your attention down to the area of your face. Noticing any sensations there. Slowly moving your attention around to the back of your head, noticing any sensations. 